An entire world is ready for you to start your career teaching the path to wellness. Mastering the science of mindfulness and the art of coaching to help clients achieve mental, emotional, and physical betterment of life through movement, nutrition, recovery, and regeneration. Because impacting one person impacts a family. Impacting a family impacts a community. And impacting a community impacts the world. Become an NASM Certified Wellness Coach. You are listening to the NASM CPT Podcast with Rick Ritchie, the official podcast of the National Academy of Sports Medicine. Hey, y'all, and welcome to the NASM CPT Podcast. My name is Rick Ritchie, and today we have a guest. I like it when we have guests because I like to listen and learn from other people, and I hope that you do too. I think sometimes the sound of my voice can get a little old, and even though I will be talking with this guest, you will be learning a lot from this individual. So as many of you know, I had recently, within the last couple of years, got into running just as a means of exercise and something that could help lower my blood glucose. However, winter in New York City has not been my friend, so running has not been as often. You may also remember a few months ago, I had a researcher by the name of Rob Gray. And he's a like a motor learning researcher. And he, we talked about the constraints-led approach to training. Well, this week, we're going to kind of take those two things and do a mashup. So we're going to be talking with a guest today about the constraints-led approach to running, and there are different types of running, and I'm sure we'll talk about those things, but let me introduce you to someone. He is currently the owner of Just Fly Sports in Cincinnati area, and he hosts this podcast. Check it out. It's called Just Fly Performance Podcast, so check it out. He's got some great guests on there, and he does an excellent job engaging with those guests, including Rob Gray, who was on the show that I was talking about earlier. He is. Uh, he was the strength coach for Olympic sports athletes at UC Berkeley for eight years and then spent six years coaching track and field in NCAA Division three schools and coached on a, a club track for seven, seven, seven years. I was going to say several, and then I did a mash up again unintentionally. He's the author of print books, Speed Strength and Vertical Foundations, and published research on plyometrics in his grad school days in the biomechanics lab. Welcome my guest today, Joel Smith. Hey, Joel Smith, what's up? How are you? Hey, Rick. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Was that was that intro a bit much? I mean, I just kept going and going because you had so much for me to keep going yeah, with. Yeah, it's probably it's probably my fault. You know, and like the world, I think the more we learn, the more we realize we need to simplify over time to have those effective principles. I probably need to do that with my bio. So, um, but you know, thanks. I, and for I cut me. some stuff out, yeah. so that's the funny part. <laughs> that's no, the I, trimmed I really down got, version. I really got some work to do there. <laughs> No, you're fantastic, man. I'm looking forward to having you on the show because after we initially connected, uh, I I jumped into your podcast and started listening to some of the episodes, and I really dig it. I dig the way that I, I like your sound. I like how you come across. Uh, you are certainly in the know in the topics that you have that you're discussing with the guests that you have, and you've had some really great guests. And some of those guests are some people that I'm looking to have on the show at some point as well. So I'm not jealous, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> you beat me to the punch and yeah, okay, I'm jealous. I'm jealous. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's been uh, like, I, I love learning and it's just been a huge um, honor for me to be able to have so many individuals on on my show. So, and I've gotten plenty of them from listening to other podcasts as well. So it's always it's just fun thinking of the process of how, you know, a guest comes on your radar. So I'm happy to have provided any sort of inspiration there. And yeah, I'm sure we'll, we mutually, I think you had Rob Gray on before I actually did. So you, I beat, did. you beat me there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. And listen, Hey, I want to, I want to, speaking of Rob Gray, he's such a great guest. His podcast is so good. Um, and I want to talk about, running, which which you have a specialization in, but not just that, but one of the things that Rob talked about when he was on the show, which is the constraints-led approach 
to training, to working with people. So if you could give us a little explanation of what a constraints-led approach is, what that means, and then we can start talking uh, over the next 20, 30 minutes on what that means for us in the fitness industry and how we can we can implement it and apply it. Yeah, for sure. So that, to me, it's it's interesting as well, is of all the podcasts I've done, the ones that are always the most popular are always the ones that are very like simple, quantifiable output stuff. Like anything that's like the speed podcast people love or improve your mm. output in the weight room people love. When you get into motor learning, for some reason, I don't know, there's less interest right off the outset, but I think it's because people don't understand what they're missing, if that makes sense. Uh, and I so, agree. And it's a thicker onion to peel, I think. Yeah. I totally agree. In the book, you know, Rob gives like, he tries to, uh, gives a good, like, he makes like a business and you have the or the management, you have the middlemen, you have the people on the ground. And just, I think that the more ways that we can create analogies as to how the body, the human body learns, I, I think the more people understand that this is really important. And so uh, to your question, the constraints led approach, uh, what that is, is basically instead of saying, um, like you have an athlete, let's just say running, because that's what we're talking about. And you see this all the time. It's just kind of almost like a given. This is how we do it, or at least it has been. Hopefully this will change. If someone's learning to run, I saw this in club track practice. As I was just an assistant there, so that the head coaches, they had the way they did things. And they would have the athletes run 800 meters and all the athletes. So distance runners, sprinters, whatever. And then they would go through all their sprint drills. So let's just take, take like, and most sprint drills are marching oriented. So let's say an mm -hmm. A skip is a pretty popular um, exercise, a marching base drill where you're trying to be upright, tall, having high knees. Um, that's that's not the CLA. That's like a drill perfect form way of running. It's like saying, all right, there is a perfect way to run or a really good way to run. And mm -hmm. we want to put you in that mold. So that would be the not, not constraints. That's like, per, I would call that perfect form technique or learning, uh, which Rob deconstructs that. And, and me and Rob had a great conversation of that. Um, yeah. Rob deconstructs in his book, and we had a great conversation of it on my podcast. The CLA would be like different types of running. You're putting a constraint. Uh, so instead of having them go through drills, say, all right, I want you to, we would put up like little mini hurdles for them to run over that and, and my mind, ideal are very low and high, the higher, once you get too high, you actually start doing some negative things, but you would um, put mini hurdles and they run over those. Running uphill is a constraint. Running downhill is a constraint. Mm -hmm. Skipping is a constraint because there's a certain way you skip without necessarily telling them how to skip. Just say, just start skipping, start galloping, run with one arm. Like, and they get to pick how they solve that problem. So what we could say is this uh, constraint sled approach with running, for example, is giving athletes or individuals or clients, I say athletes a lot because that's very much my population, yeah. but giving individuals a problem to solve not and not telling them this is how you do it. There are nuances to that, uh, that end of the story that like Nick Winkleman, um, big language uh, uh, based individual, you can get into those, but just from a pure definition approach, it's giving someone a problem to solve and letting them do it. Not necessarily, not you're not holding their hand through it and saying this is the way. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things in there, there's um, there are a few, they're, they're brothers, they're in uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, they're Brazilian guys, the Miao brothers. And they didn't really early on have any formal training in jiu-jitsu. And then they started competing and they were really fantastic and they beat a lot of people because they were so unorthodox in how they were doing it and they were still really really quite good so there's there's something to it where they didn't learn exactly the way that the the gracies trained or exactly the way that certain groups trained but they learned how to do it and kind of self-solve but they were brothers and they fought all the time they wrestled all the time they did jujitsu all the time and this uniqueness in their approach allowed them to win these accolades and these tournaments across the boards, which I think is really interesting because it's the difference between somebody teaching you how to solve a problem, which I still don't have any issue with, versus exploring how to solve a problem. Now, when we talk about, like you talked about the, the A skips and the B skips, that is do it this way. Right. So this is not solving a problem within itself. It's just this is the way that you're supposed to do it. There's another thing that you talked about with the supposed to's, 
with Rob Gray. And we, and we touched on it on our podcast together as well. Can you discuss some supposed to's and there are some things that are in fact supposed to happen, but there's also coaching that maybe limits somebody in exploring how they would move in themselves by being taught how to do something a very specific way. Yeah, uh, for sure. That's an awesome, that's an awesome question with respect to running. So in terms of, um, I would say there's almost two categories. There's principles and positions. And mm. the principles would be, and, and this is a little bit more for sprinting versus versus distance running as a, like a total thing. But uh, some, some principles that you'll hear might be uh, run tall. Uh, you need to be up tall and upright. Uh, and now that is from the sacrum to the head, there is definitely a trueness to that. Um, good athletes tend to have some length to their spine and that general, there's a general elongation. But in terms of actually when the principle is applied to run tall to, let's just say sprinters, for example, 400 meter runners, this mm -hmm. could go for anyone. And usually this is what you'll hear in marching drills. So if I'm coaching an A skip, yeah. usually you'll hear oh, run tall, get tall. The thing is, is what happens when it's too vertically uh, directed. Uh, think of it like this way, like, uh, like you have a, a rock on a string, like a pendulum, and you'll see it presented in running that you want that rock to hit right under the hips. For some reason, people say you should do that. I, I still, I, it's crazy because that does not happen uh, in actual running, be it distance or sprinting. And I think it might be more of a sprint term, but what would happen if you put your foot or your foot struck the ground directly under your hips is you would fall on your face because the, there has yeah. to be friction when the foot strikes and the foot striking actually slightly out in front creates an upright support. It creates this spike of vertical force that is an upright. And I don't want to get too, if I'm getting too far in the weeds of biomechanics, you please hold me up. Um, I dig it. So <laughs> you keep going. I'm, I'm listening. <laughs> okay, cool. Because I've, I've had multiple moments on my podcast where I'm just like, I, I think I, I, both myself and my guests, it's just like, go way out there. So um, I try to keep this pretty simple and a good visual. But you think of that pendulum. That, that string does not hang all the way to the bottom with the rock. It does have to strike in front of the athlete. And when I watch a lot of drills, and you'll see this in weight room exercises too, is, is like a step up. You see this knee drive and vertical lift motion on everything. It's like we want to apply this drive the knee and lift vertically and tall on everything we do. And when you watch running, that's not what happens. And when I watch um, A skips and marching based drills, I will always see uh, and I learned this from a swim coach who was uh, a, just a big motor learning guy, one of my mentors in motor learning. I think the world of swimming has taught me a lot and can offer a mm -hmm. lot for anyone because it, it happens. It's There's more sensory points in swimming versus running. You have yeah. this constant interaction. And so one of the things that this my mentor told me is watch the athlete or the client when they're moving and see what their intention is. Like I'll ask, one of the first things I oftentimes have people do is just say skip and I don't tell them anything. And I usually see oftentimes is people doing things with their arms and their legs that they feel they're expected to do, if yes. that makes sense. But that's not how we move. It's just something that you feel like you're expected to do. So a, a principle, in short, coming back around, a principle that doesn't work is run tall. Because what that does when that's your intention is you, instead of using the hip to run, because the hip is almost more of a horizontal mover, the glutes, it's more of a horizontal tool. And when we look at Sprinting, for example, there's research. Um, this was highlighted as a meta-analysis. Meta it's four or five studies. It's in my book, Speed Strength. Um, I'm trying to think of where. It's strengthandconditioningresearch.com. If that's still up and running, that's where this was originally posted. But it showed mm -hmm. that when we go from, like, let's say, about jogging speed, four meters per second, to max sprinting speed, what spikes is not the vertical force that people say. It's actually the horizontal force. And when we run so tall we actually lose bandwidth on the ground. Like think of it, if your hips are really high, your foot can only be on the ground for a little teeny amount of time. And that is true. When we sprint, there is, we, we don't want to be on the ground long, but we can actually take it so far. Everything is it, the middle path, right? We can get so far to the extremes that we lose things. And the middle path is the foot being on the ground for the appropriate amount of time so that the, the shin needs to fall forward and create a favorable angle to create horizontal force to apply it. And if you watch any elite runner, and the, you can see this, if um, this would be the, good, the best practice I could say to watch this in motion is watch an elite runner. 
and watch their shin action as they run. And you'll see that shin fall forward and create this favorable angle to push um, or to get um, work with the energy the ground is giving you. Now watch someone doing A skips or running with intentional high knees, intentional run tall. You're going to watch, you're going to see that the shin can no longer go through the range of motion to create a good horizontal uh, force output with the ground. So essentially just thinking run tall and then doing it on drills and all this stuff, it doesn't work when you run. And what ends up happening, I'll close it out with just this for the principle, mm -hmm. is good athletes actually just forget it. <laughs> you know, like I think Franz Bosch has said this, who's another motor learning guy, is like, the, 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 the forebrain or the conscious part of the mind forgets things really quickly. You need to talk to the subconscious when you're actually uh, creating constraints or in structure language for an athlete, they can actually retain it because those run tall things, they, they're going to sit in the, the front, like, like that conscious processing center. But when yeah. you go to do something that's innate, you're going to forget it. And so that's uh, that's one principle is just that run tall. It doesn't actually make sense when we actually um, go and perform. Oh, this is wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joel Smith, and we're talking about constraints-led approach to running. So I've got some questions that I want to follow up with. Um, one is, I'm going to use this as an example. So when I was in high school, there was a guy who, uh, we were at Bradshaw High School in Florence, Alabama, and he got a scholarship as a track athlete, sprinter, to go to Georgia Tech. And it was a big deal. He was very good. When I watched him run, he ran with his arms out super wide. And some coaches say, well, that's uh, he's already fast, so don't mess with what's already there. And some other coaches will say, well, if we can bring those arms a bit more in line, we think that that will actually add, you know, a tenth of a second, you know, uh, five, one, four one hundredths of a second to his time, which is good when you're pushing yourself at an elite level. Um, first of all, what's, where would you kind of land on that spectrum? And then if there was to be an adjustment of bringing the elbows in because he was super wide, what may be a constraints led approach to helping Kofi switch into a more narrow arm swing? Yeah, that, that is an awesome question because it's just pure nice. practical, right? Like this is yeah. what we face. This is what we <laughs> see in people we're working uh, with to run, because to be honest, if you do the marching drills with no real horizontal velocity, everyone can have that perfect. It's actually not perfect. I right. can't even say the word perfect. I, right, anyone yes. can put their arm where you want it when you're not moving fast horizontally. Once you're going fast <laughs> horizontally, now you have all these 3D forces like ball and socket joints. This isn't just even an MIT robot because, ro I mean, it probably will be in, you know, however many years. Well, but sure. I mean, we have we we are rotational beings. And so once you actually get moving, there's a lot more that comes into play. And that's why it is interesting to hear people say, oh man, we worked on this technique and then this athlete ran and they didn't do any of it. Well, they didn't because they're trying to run as fast as they can. And the thing that you're teaching them is actually going to slow them down. I'll, I just want to share one story very quickly before I get yeah. into what I would do with that athlete. Okay. And um, this is more in the track and field sprints world again, but I mean, this can apply to just about anything. As, and, and there are bandwidths, but like before I even get any farther, you can't, like Rob Gray, when he was on, my podcast talked about good variability and bad variability and bad variability is just like, and you know this when you see it, someone's just running and they're just a total wreck. Like they're uncoordinated, right. they're sloppy, they're, they're um, not proactive with the ground, but they're just totally reactive. Like the ground hit, they hit the ground. There's just a shockwave that comes up and it's just this sloppy mess. And I, I don't know any way to describe it better than that, but if you've seen people run and move, you, you know that when you see it. Um, you know, we can get to get into the nuances of that would take a lot of video and probably be like a one to two hour, you know, like mini series. But uh, there there's there's certain bandwidths. And so like as long as you're within those bandwidths, you're be, trying to get to like as long as you're within those bandwidths, the the nuances of saying you should really be here um, is really not something to be concerned about. And so a good example um, in the world of track and field, uh, Abby Steiner is a sprinter. She's at the University of Kentucky. And she was a soccer player and a track athlete in high school. And that's one of the awesome things is, is with sprinting, sport, playing soccer, playing basketball, playing football, playing ultimate frisbee, that's a constraint for sprinting because you right. always yeah. have a constraint. You have to go get the ball. You have to play defense. You have to run to a spot. And I think that we, we totally underestimate how good sport is as a constraint for running for some reason and that's another thing the whole another rabbit trail too is like this mass 
hyper specialization with youth sports where instead of these kids playing multiple sports, they're instead going to, and again, I think there's so many sports performance coaches out there doing good work, but instead it's like, Hey, you're, you know, you're a young kid, you're 10, 12, and you're only doing one sport and I'm going to teach you to run faster. Well, maybe you should just play another sport. That's another type constraint for running too. I mean, there's, I love that's, that. that's massive. And so anyways, Abby Steiner was a soccer player and, and then a state record holder in Ohio for the 100 and 200 meter dash. And she's, she just um, beat the uh, NCAA and the American record for the indoor 200. Uh, and I don't, I think nationals is still coming up. So she might run even faster. And one thing that's really interesting, really interesting to watch her run is indoor sprinting. It's a little more, they have these raised tracks and it's a little more tight and it's a little more, you have yeah. to be a little more athletic in some ways. And the way she starts is so different than everyone else. Her arms are kind of down, running like Ronaldo, the soccer player runs. What? And, and then, yeah, whereas everyone else is kind of hitting more of these, like, more typical arm angles. But the really yeah. defining nuance of, of what she does is if you watch her sprint from the front, you'll see that her left arm crosses over the center line of her body. So past her sternum into the other side almost. It depends on the camera angle. But it's definitely way more than everybody else. And then, of course, interesting. All, all the and this is the American record holder. And all the comments are like, "Oh, she needs to fix her arms." Blah blah blah. You know. And so, but this is the thing. And this is this is in the weeds a little bit. But it's an asymmetrical action. It's not both arms. It's only the left. Oh, and, interesting. Yeah, and yeah, and, and the more you know, and this is the thing too: is is team sport players are intuitive runners. Huh. They weren't coached to run a certain way. Intuition takes over. They run from the subconscious. And the way, I mean, the brain is so brilliant. I mean, you know, there's the whole AI is going to take over in 10 years or when will AI, when will supercomputers beat the brain? It's still not there. It's still not even close someday. Yeah. But right now the brain is still more powerful. And so you have this quantum supercomputer, like taking all these joints, all these motions and putting forth, putting it forth to achieve the outcome, which is running as fast as possible. And so with um, Abby Steiner in particular, it, this is my theory on the reasons she does that. And this is not, I'm try not trying to overcomplicate things, but we are by nature asymmetrical. You have, your lungs are different. You know, if you look at Postural Restoration Institute and those principles, your heart is situated more on one side and you have actually more air in the chamber in your right lung than your left. I hope I'm not switching that up. But what tends to happen is people naturally tend to push just a little bit longer off their left than their right in many cases. It's not like crazy, but it is It is kind of like this give and take thing where there is a slightly natural asymmetry to pretty much everybody. I mean, you look at Usain Bolt at scoliosis. Granted, he didn't have a long career, but that's part of the reason it's been said that tracks go left because the way that the organs rotate in the body uh, would cause this turning stimulus. A anyways, I'm just all I'm saying by that is there is an asymmetrical nature to human movement based off how we are constructed. And I, my, it's my opinion that she is naturally and organically moving that left arm there to fit with the way her body works from an asymmetrical perspective. Now, if you overcoach that, you're going to run into problems. You're taking away her strength, and everything else is in the bandwidth. It's all in the bandwidth, and it looks good. Um, right. And so. and just so you know, there uh, just so they uh, the people listening, there's something in sports performance called a performance bandwidth. And the performance bandwidth says if you're within this range, you don't have to cue it. You don't have to coach it. They're fine. So they fall within the performance bandwidth. Anything outside of that bandwidth, one way or the other, you might want to cue it. You might want to coach it. You might want to refine it. So is that what you're talking about when you say bandwidth? Yeah, a hundred percent. I'm glad you brought okay. that up. I just had um Bush Nextator on my podcast, like a famed track and field coach, strength coach, talking about how he keeps it simple. And basically for him, it's like once they're in that bandwidth, I don't get carried away with the nuances of trying to make it quote unquote perfect. And this is a guy who's coached so many like elite athletes, been in the game for a long time, super respected. And so yeah, once people are in that bandwidth, like self-organization, I mean, there's other things too, like in terms of there is, it's not to say you should never instruct somebody. There's a, that's own like little world, internal versus external cues and analogies. Yeah. Um, but to, to your, um, the story you're talking about, like, let's just say the athlete who runs with their arms wide out to the side. Yes. Um, what I'm, what I'm looking for is, well, first is that in the bandwidth, if I want to be a track athlete, is that in the bandwidth? Now, if I want to be a soccer player or a football athlete, maybe it is because those athletes need to be have a running style that caters to changing direction more quickly. If you, as a team sport athlete, run like a track athlete at top speed, and you don't really have any other running options and strategies, you will be at a disadvantage. So I do think that athletes who play more 
like just short court stuff, like it's all like very shorter bursts, their running style may have adapted to the need to just change directions frequently. So with an athlete who is adapted to that and runs track, my um, strategy is to see if I can provide, and they're out of the bandwidth. Let's just say they're, they're too wide. They're wasting okay. a little, yeah. probably more energy than they should. It is then to create constraints uh, or slight constraints to see if they can solve the problem themselves. The first constraint, to be honest, could be just get track spikes up and spend time running track and not, not necessarily playing your sport for a few months. See what happens. Let's just let's be patient and just see if that fixes things. Let's see if those arms start to come down a little bit. If they don't, and this is something that was really, um, I was at a retreat with Rafe Kelly, who is a big like human mm-hmm. movement parkour guy, and he's fascinated with how good parkour athletes can actually be at like long jump and triple jump and stuff without training for it necessarily lot because their world is <laughs> a variable training. Um, right. But th- that being said, one of the things that was brought up was, not to coach something or bring the change sling until the athlete upon repeated effort shows they can't do it themselves. And I think that's important. It's like, even like having children myself, like I'm becoming more and more aware of just give them chances to make mistakes. Don't rush in and try to fix it right away. Give the athlete the chance. And so that's, I think the first thing is give them the chance. Don't feel like you have to coach every little bit. And I know doing like one-on-ones, it's harder, right? Cause it's like, well, what are you paying me for? Just <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> I, And I get that. I get that. But um, so my, I would say, okay, first, just put in your track spikes and run and let's just see how you do. If, if nothing's changing, uh, there's some, now let's, let's look to some constraints for the arms. One would be some sort of handheld feedback. Uh, David Weck, who uh, inv- the inventor of the BOSU ball, which most p- people would know him for, he invented these little things uh, called, I think they're called something else now, but he had called them pulsers. And it's basically like an eight ounce shaking hand weight. And all that does is it just gives your hand sensory feedback so you can auto correct. And very often people will use these weights and instantly run faster. Like it's a 60 or what? whatever, even distance, you will instantly run faster. And the question is why? Well, you gave your amazing supercomputer some more sensory information and it's going to use it, you know? And I think a lot of what we have problems with is not that we don't know some technique, but we just don't have awareness. If you think of okay. like, think of like a, you know, a, a, a caveman or a, uh, someone who has to interact with that that type of individual who has to interact with nature on a regular basis, they're barefoot or have minimal type shoes. Uh, and that's a whole nother story, but they're they're getting all this sensory information, all this movement. Um, that person is going to need a lot less what we would call coaching than someone who has no awareness. And, and honestly, my solution is to try to give you awareness first and see if you can auto correct. So like run with like these little shaking hand weights, um, that could be a solution. And then I, there's a, there's other things you could I mean some people even do a half empty water bottles or something you know just something that gives you sensory info and then yeah. some other things I might do would be uh, one arm running so just say hey run with one arm because guess what uh, if you run with one arm and you're winging your elbow real far you're actually now you can't counterbalance rotation anymore because if you yeah, have two arms, interesting you yeah if you have one arm you can't and it's really that simple like just and so maybe one arms and let's put paint sticks on the ground run over some paint sticks and run with one arm. Uh, run with one arm, then bring in the other for 20 meters. Run one arm, bring in the other for 20 meters. Like those kind of things. So it's just alternating variation, allowing people to feel and experience and learn on their own the way a child does. And that's why I love this stuff. And that's why I'm like, I'm kind of sad when people don't like hop on the motor learning train because it's not like, you know, oh, lift more and, and whatever. But it's like, this is the foundation of how we learn and move. And I think, and we could even say there's there's an experiential component that's really enjoyable. So that's what I would look uh, for initially with an athlete who's like the, the crazy shoulder winger. Uh, all right, ladies and gentlemen, we got Joel Smith here talking to us about the constraints led approach to running specifically, which is really good because that's what we wanted to talk about. I want to ask you a few more questions then. Can we uh, differentiate some of the ways that you may implement a constraints led approach with a sprinter versus somebody who's going to run more of a distance with whatever variables that you think that would be ideal to talk about. For sure. Yeah. So with sprinting, I think the, the big thing that I would look at is I like to use like lower mini hurdles occasionally for as a constraint uh, by low, I mean, under four inches tall. So, or paint sticks on the ground. So that would be a constraint. That would be something that's a little bit more sprinter type oriented. Um, there's also uh, things that are called, um, it's called Lila. So it's like micro weights. It's like, so instead of like a weight vest, it's these like fusiform shaped 50, 100, 200 gram little teeny weights that you can strategically place on the body. Boom, there's your, you know, there's your constraint. And you could do that for distance running too. The big constraints that I look at for distance running 
Uh, one would be the the hand. The, the hand things are universal. Um, the the one arm could still fit in there, but to me, it's terrain. Um, to me, mm. the terrain is the ultimate constraint um, and footwear. So these, I feel like, are the two like big key factors. If I'm going to learn to run, like let's say I'm going to do a 5K. Well, a lot of people just go and they run on the road or a treadmill because it's the easiest. And I get it. You know, not a, all of us live near a park. It's unfortunate. Um, but you have the, the world's greatest constraint. Like seriously, if you like I always believe the answers are found in nature. And if you live next to any sort of trail, any sort of terrain that's not a road or a treadmill um, or a, a clean, squeaky path, you have in front of you um, variability. And so the question is, mm. is how are you going to use it? And I'll, I will say this too, is this is a, there's also a footwear, an important footwear element in this very, in this constraints led approach, because your shoes are also a constraint and having shoes that are just like massive and don't allow you any sensory on the foot, uh, that is going to decrease your awareness. Now, this is another like thing that tr I'm actually, I'm, I'm working on a, a, the, a foot book, who knows when it's actually going to be done, but I did a massive amount of research for it on like barefoot because everyone's like oh go barefoot you got to go barefoot it's the only way to go but i mean we created artificial shoes for artificial surfaces i mean right. okay concrete exists do you think running barefoot on it <laughs> is the best idea you could um but so i'll just say like i would definitely go for minimal shoes if you have like a, a natural surface like think grass that might be slightly uneven surfaces trails that aren't okay. too hard those that is what the what more of the barefoot stuff in my opinion is meant for and the research would show that actually if you um do like a 5k program and you you go with barefoot type shoes and you're running on the roads or a treadmill you actually have a pretty high chance of getting hurt and there's other reasons for that but i look natural meets natural artificial meets artificial and so running uh, as variable as you can and then if in nature trying to use things that increase your awareness and then the last thing i'll say is if you're in the unfortunate situation where you live in a concrete jungle um, and you don't have that much of like options there is use what you have um a buddy of mine paul cater who i knew when i was in california um and a guy i've learned a lot from when he goes out for a run the, I, this kind of blew me away because no one else ever does this. But if he goes for a run in a neighborhood, he's like running off and on of curves. He's trying to make use of whatever's around to give himself some variability. And I think we see that if you watch like the half marathon or the marathon going through town, you see a lot of people just kind of plodding, just kind of they're not looking like they're really enjoying it. And I just feel like running should be linked to the emotions of joy and freedom. And part of that is being with and, and inter interacting with your environment makes it more vibrant. And I, but again, nature is the optimal, but you can, you can make use of what you have too. So I, for me, that's the ultimate constraint is footwear and making use of your environment and different terrains types. I got to say that there are a lot of people that run for fun, but when they get to the marathon, it's miserable. It's, <laughs> it's not fun. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's, it's pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. That's a challenge is there indeed. Uh, Joel, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to, to grace us with some of the knowledge that you have on running and the constraints-led approach. Uh, can you do this? Can you give uh, people information about you, where to find you on social, about your podcast, so that they can follow you? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks again for having me. And yeah, you can keep up with me and what I'm up to at uh, to justflysports.com or the Twitter and Instagram. It's uh, just fly sports uh, with no the, the websites with with hashes the the socials are just just fly sports and you can catch up with me there podcast is just fly performance podcast on all the podcast channels excellent and i do recommend that to people because uh, like i said i started listening to it big fan and i will be using it to pull some people from because uh, you have some great guests on there so thank you so much for being here i appreciate it that is uh that's joel smith and i want to say thank you to all of you who listen if you get a chance like share subscribe leave some comments about the podcast it'd be greatly appreciated if you want to reach out to me, you can do so on Instagram where I'm most active, dr.rickritchie, or you can email me at rick.ritchie at nasm.org. Thank you so much. This has been the NASM CPT Podcast.